I'll tell you what, let's just go ahead and get into the Bible study tonight, if you'd like to. Turn to the book of Genesis 28. Genesis chapter number 28. The book of Genesis has so many themes. So what is a theme? A theme is a subject or an object or something of that nature that has its beginnings and you trace it all through the scripture and find out all the things it relates to and then the progressive revelation that you'll get from that theme. And here in the book of Genesis chapter number 28 and verse number 10, the Bible said, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou liest to thee, will I give it unto thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again to this land, for I, have, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And a Jacob wakened out of his sleep. And he said, Surely Jehovah, the Lord, is in this place, and I knew it not. Now watch this. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, Bethel, in Hebrew. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And the Father blessed his holy book now. Thy name I pray, amen. amen. You can be seated. Amen. The book said, the Bible said in the book of Joel that they will dream dreams, and obviously this is a dream, and it came from the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he wasn't even a believer, but it came from the Lord. And of course, it teaches the book of De the book of Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar teaches you that God's a sovereign God, control of everything. But you notice here that we have a stone. He took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar. And this is not unusual. They have stones all over the Holy Land down through the time. You remember I told you about the themes of the Bible. One, a stone is a theme that runs all through the Scripture. But now this is important because this coming Friday they're going to, they're going to, they're going to crown the king of England, Charles III. Uh, they'll pick up broadcasting, I think, about 5 o'clock here. It starts about 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, normally, they're five hours ahead of us, but I'm not sure if they don't have, uh, if they don't have this uh, uh, daylight savings time, we've jumped forward an hour, so there's four hours difference. But in any event, they're ahead of us, and so obviously they start, uh, they'll be starting earlier than we are. And uh, about 5.30 Saturday morning, uh, Charles III will will enter a procession that leads him to Westminster Abbey. And there, as his mother was, he will be crowned as the King of England. This will be May the 6th, 2023. And according to what they're saying, Camilla, his wife, apparently from indication is will be crowned the Queen. She's a Queen consort right now, showing that uh, Charles is the, uh, is the King without question. But in any event, that's not important to me. I just wanted to give you a, uh, something that, uh, that might help you understand a little bit about where you are. You look in the past, you look forward, and then look where you're standing now. Lessons are to be learned from history. There are those who teach that the British throne is a continuation of the Davidic throne. Now, when the king is coronated this coming Saturday, he will have a stone beneath him in an ancient chair. It's called the Stone of Scone. Scone is a church in Scotland, and uh, we'll get into that in a moment. Some adherents further claim the British royal family is, a lineal uh, is of lineal descent from the house of King David. 
the daughter of Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. According to the legend, the prophet Jeremiah and his bride, or his scribe rather, Baruch, escaped with the king's daughters, Jeremiah 41, 10, 43, 6, to Egypt. They later traveled to Ireland where one of the surviving Judahite princesses, T. Tepe, or Tephi, married a local high king of Ireland. From this fabled union, the Davidic throne was supposedly preserved. Having been transferred to Ireland, then Scotland, and later England, whence the British monarchs are alleged to have descended, the Stone of Scone, which has been used in the coronations of Scottish, English, and British monarchs for centuries, is traditionally claimed to be the pillow stone on which the biblical patriarch Jacob, that I just read in Genesis 28, we read about that stone, and they say they have that stone. And uh, the biblical patriarch Jacob slept in the stone used in David's coronation. Now, please understand me before we get any further. This is simply a matter of, of uh, observation and doing a little research and a little reading into a lot of this stuff. It doesn't necessarily mean that I believe a bit of it. But to get your, to get your bearings, you, you need to understand where people are, what they think and uh, what's, what's happening. And it's always good to know what the other fellow's thinking. Wouldn't you like to know what people really think? No. You won't know it? <laughs> God spares us from that, doesn't he? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, a word fitly chosen is what we're talking about. But the coronation of Elizabeth II, Queen of the United Kingdom and of other Commonwealth realms. And we're going to get into that in just a moment to give you an idea of what's going on here. A lot of people think, now, what's the population of England or Great Britain? 67 million people approximately. The population of France, 67 million people. So essentially the two nations have the same population, but that's very misleading. And you're going to find out why. You're going to find out why it is so important for the world to watch the coronation of King Charles III. But in any event, she succeeded the throne at age 25 on the death of her father, George VI, on 6 February 1952. And from that moment till the time she died, she became the longest serving monarch in English history, Queen Elizabeth II. And um, when, uh, when uh, Ronald Reagan, our president, sent troops to, I forget where it was, uh, somewhere in the Pacific, to, in the, uh, or down in the Caribbean, somewhere in there, she said to him, Why, what do you think you're doing sending your troops to my country? That's what Elizabeth said to the president. And that wasn't England that the troops went to. But in any event, it's just something to give you an idea of what's going on. Because you see, the, 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 uh, the Commonwealth of Countries, the Commonwealth of Countries numbers 56 member states the vast majority of these states were former territories of the British Empire. That's quite remarkable. If you remember under Victoria, the sun never set on the British Empire. It's the largest empire that ever existed on this earth. And uh, I don't know if you've read much about uh, uh, Sir Winston Churchill, but he wrote a, he wrote a history of the English speaking people. It's a very interesting tome. You might want to read some of the things that, uh, that Churchill uh, believed and some of the things that he had uh, as it related to the British Empire. But in any event, 56 nations belong to the British Empire, or em not empire, but the Commonwealth of, of, uh, of nations. And it, uh, the total land area is 12,200,000 square miles with a population, now hold on, of 2.5 billion, that's with a B, people. In plain words, she's a queen over a much larger area than simply the British Empire, or keep saying empire, <laughs> Brit Britain, Great Britain, the United Kingdom. And uh, so this sets it in a completely different light this coming Saturday because what it does, 
it says, well, my goodness gracious, then we have an awful lot of countries that are directly involved with this coronation than we ever thought possible. Now, the population of the United States is about 330 million or so, give or take, somewhere in there, latest uh, uh, calculations, 330 million. Uh, India, they say, is about to pass China. It may have passed China in population, about 1.4 billion. And China is there, same, 1.34 billion people. So America, as far as population is concerned, with 330 million is what you might call a a large, small country in population, right, to get it in perspective, right. Of course, we have NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. You understand that. You know why it was formed. At least I hope they taught you that in school. I hope they're teaching, still teaching stuff like that in school because that's important to know. Uh, when Stalin finally got a hold of Eastern Europe, he was ready to take the whole country, all the countries of Europe, and he set about to do it. And... Uh, and so in any event, the Commonwealth of Nations, therefore, will be included in this, in this power uh, that you're going to see happen this coming Friday. And this stone of scone, this stone of scone that we're talking about, which was the stone supposedly that we read about in the book of Genesis, chapter number 29, I think it was, is going to be brought back from Scotland because they gave it to Scotland uh, under the condition that it would be used at coronation of their monarchs. And so they've brought it back. It's in England now. They brought it back. And when Charles III is coronated as the king of England, he will be sitting on that stone. Now think about it for a minute. Why is that important? Why is that important? Why is it important to make a direct connection with the Davidic throne and with that stone and that stone has to do with God's blessing and promise to Jacob and to his seed after him. Why is that important? Now, when you look at the English flag, you have a, what's called a Union Jack. Uh, it has a red cross like this, which was worn by the Knights Templar. How many has ever heard of them? Yeah. The Knights Templar. And uh, it's uh, named after King George. King George was a military knight. He was a... Uh, he was a fighter. He was a, uh, he stood for the, uh, I'm going to get into a whole lot about that, but what I've read about it is that he represents chivalry or the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the offices and so forth of royalty uh, in England. And so therefore that cross of King, of, uh, of uh, cross of George is uh, red. Then in Scotland, you have a cross like this, and that cross is blue on a white field, and that's the cross of, of uh, anybody know? Andrew. Andrew was Simon Peter's brother, and Andrew said when they crucified him, says that he was crucified, that he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord was, and so they crucified him on a cross like this. There's great tradition, now this is all tradition, says that the Apostle Peter was crucified upside down, saying the same thing, that he's not worthy. Take it with a grain of salt. You've heard it, but don't ever, don't ever join on, don't ever jump on some wagon or join up with a group until you know for certain that that's true. And I'm not saying it's at all that it's true. I'm not saying at all, at all that Peter was crucified upside down. But in any event, you have a third cross like this, and it's called the cross of, uh, it's over there in Ireland. What's his name? Just had his day not too long ago. That's right, Patrick. It's red. So you join three crosses together. You have the cross of Andrew, the cross of uh, Patrick, and then you have the cross of George. And this becomes the Union Jack of the British Empire or the British Commonwealth or Great Britain and so forth. Now, they traced their lineage back to the house of David, and they, uh, <laughs> they have uh, a union jack for a, for, for a flag. And then William Blake wrote this poem, and it's set to the tune of Jerusalem. If you've ever heard it, it's a beautiful song. And here are the words. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? And was the holy Lamb of God 
on England's pleasant pastures seen. And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. So I've given you quite a bit to let you know that there is a religious connection yeah. under Queen Victoria and the British Empire, that it was a religious mandate from God that the British people would rule over the world. Now, its counterpart in America was the uh, Columbia, and that is Manifest Destiny. And there's some beautiful, well, I don't know, I enjoy art, but there's one in particular of a woman that's leading the, the Caucasian people, the Easterners, the Europeans, west across America. And the Indian, and they call them Native Americans today, are running in terror. And they're spreading the truth and light and uh, the manifest destiny from Almighty God. The capital of this country is called... What's it located there? What's that called? D.C. What's that stand for? The District of Columbia. Okay. Britannia is the female personification of the British power, struggle, authority, and all that goes with it. Britannia. And they've got a song about Britannia rules the waves. Well, at one time, absolutely, they did. Long after the United States became a sovereign nation, the, the Navy of Great Britain was larger than any Navy on earth. That's one of the reasons, that's one of the things that helped them spread the British Empire, was that Navy they had. But in any event, Columbia represented America and its movement west. Napoleon Bonaparte liked to fight wars. He went into Russia and it cost him dearly. But until then, Bonaparte was conquering Europe, Napoleon, French. France, and uh, but wars are expensive. They get very, they get very expensive. Cost a lot of money. A lot of people make money, and a lot of people lose money in wars. So uh, what happened? Well, he needed money, and he owned a stretch of land over here. Pretty good sized stretch of land. Quite a bit, and we had a smart president. You remember what his name was? No. Who? It, somebody said it. Thomas. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, he said, I'll buy it. And they called it the Louisiana Purchase. It more than doubled the size of the United States. So he got him a couple of men to go west, Lewis and Clark. They headed west to check out this new territory that the United States had bought. And they wound up on a big river out there that emptied into the Pacific Ocean. What do they call it? Columbia. The Columbia. From sea to shining sea, Columbia. So the District of Columbia is the seat of the national government. Columbia is the, is, the, uh, is the female personification of all that America stands for and this and that and its call from God and so forth. And, and from that, of course, if you feel like that you are definitely, uh, this is what God's called you to do and, and, uh, and all that, well, then uh, it gives you a divine mandate to set about and do what you're doing. Now, you know as well as I do, the United States is a country that's joined, is, that's states, United States of America. There's 50 of them now, 48 when I went through school. And I remember when Hawaii and when, uh, what was that other one? Hawaii. See, I'm giving you all, <laughs> you know, you're having, you're having quiz tonight. <laughs> Alaska, exactly. Until then, I was told time and time and time and time and time again, the largest state in the United States was what? Texas, absolutely. That's why it's the Lone Star State, Texas. And it was one of the few that was a, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a sovereign uh, republic, Republic of Texas. So uh, when, when, uh, when, uh, when, when Charles is, is uh, coronated, he will be the king over the United Kingdom, and he'll also uh, have sovereign recognition 
over the British Commonwealth. Uh, one of the things, if you do a little research into the British Commonwealth, it's quite interesting. Many of these nations I told you a moment ago are part of the old British Empire. Colon colon col colonial colonialism. Colon colonies. America was a colony. All right. And so the whole idea was to destroy the British Empire, get rid of it. <laughs> but it's an odd thing. They, you start a commonwealth and they all won't back in. <laughs> That's the truth. And some of them pulled out and now they're wanting back in. And there's a number of them up right now that are considering, they're being considered to come back into the commonwealth. And now this nugget. I found this out right before I came over here tonight. And that is that they are talking to the United States about coming into the British Commonwealth because we were the first colony of Great Britain and we were the first colony of Great Britain to separate from Great Britain and we separated from Great Britain by a horrible war and bad blood. But World War II joined the two nations together like they'd never been joined before when they fought against the Axis. All right. Now, there's a lot of people that believe this. It's called British Israelism, and it takes many forms, all kinds of different forms. There's different takes on it, depending on what group you're with. A lot of these people, preachers in the country and around the world, you know well who they are. I don't subscribe to that. I never have. But I do, I do believe this. I do believe that, that God's hand is in everything. Yeah. I don't care what it is. I don't care, who, I don't care what. His hand will be in what happens Saturday. No question about it whatsoever in my mind. None. Because he ruleth. Yes, he does. He's the almighty. He's the yeah. sovereign. Yeah. And, uh, but you have things that they reach in here and they pull parts of it out and they like to take this and they like to wave it over your head. And this is where we get into scripture tonight now. Let me give you some of the reasons that, I, uh, I, that, uh, that I'm a firm believer in the church of God. The church of God is not a political entity. No, it's not. No, it's not. It doesn't belong to Caesar. No. Caesar had nothing to do with the formation of it. The church of God is built by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. But you have those that are sneaking in now into the church and they're telling you that uh, Judaism, uh, what Judaism has given to us, and they've given us a lot, no question. Read the book of Acts, you'll find that, no question. The apostles were Jews. But you see, Christianity is not an extension of Judaism. No. It's not a form of Judaism. No. It's not a part of Judaism. No. Christ's church is completely and totally separate from, and, and it is a sovereign to itself, and no nation can claim it. No. But every person of Adam's race, I don't care where you go, who you are, you can be part of that church. Amen. It's made up of French, American, African, whatever. Yes. Part of the church. Now let me give you some things tonight that are important because there are people who have even come to this church at times that are being sucked into some of this stuff to where, oh, Christ is good and he's the Savior, but. Yes. Watch that but. Watch any time they try to add anything to what Christ did, you get, you're in trouble. Okay? Amen. The buts. All right, Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 14, it says this. He is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, yes. having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now, this is important. For to make in himself of twain one new man, yes. so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body of the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now, this is a powerful statement. Now, here's what's so powerful about it. Don't ever let a Jew, and I have nothing against Jews, but don't ever let a Jew look at you and say, we're superior to you because everything you have, you got from us and you don't understand what you got. Okay. Here we have here in Ephesians chapter number two, twain, one new man, Jew and Gentile. They come into Christ and when they come into Christ, they become one. In other words, there's only one man in Christ. And what man is that? That's the same man as the first Adam. Yeah. In Christ is life 
in the first Adam is death. So every person, once you are born of the Spirit of God, you are absolute and completely and fully a member of the body of Christ, in Christ, and there's no distinction, none whatsoever, none. And you're complete in Him. Now, in Romans, uh, Romans chapter, uh, Galatians 3, 25, here's the way it says it. Galatians 3, 25, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now watch what he says here in verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Okay. So for me to say that I'm a Gentile Christian and for him to say he's a Jewish Christian is, you know, that may be a personal favorite to say it, but it really means nothing in Scripture. I'm a Christian, you're a Christian. Oh, you may be a Jew, but that's, in, that's unimportant. I'm a Christian, you're a Christian. There's only one body of Christ, and if you're born again, you lose that identity. Now, what's on what he says? There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, slaves, in other words. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ, Jesus, and if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And that's a wonderful study to study Abraham's seed, but we're not going to deal with that tonight. Okay, now what, we, what do we have here then? We have in Christ, as far as he's concerned, you're not a Jew that has to hold on to some of Judaism. Amen. Sabbath days, sacrifices, and this and that, and this and that. If you do that, here's what Paul says about it in Romans 14, verse 5. Romans 14, 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You know why he said that? Because he said that because there are young Christians. It's the young Christians that they go after. That's right. All this stuff sounds good to them. You know, Sabbath days and all of that. And we can learn more about God through the Sabbath days, especially if we get involved in them. No, you'll learn more about God and the Lord Jesus Christ than anything else right. in the Bible. If you want to know something about the Father, study the Son. Yes. Right. He came to make Him known to us. But anyway, look at this now. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. All right, that's simple. So how do you do? I respect if a man says, I have to keep the Sabbath. All right, I respect you for doing that. One day you'll grow up and you'll learn that you don't have to keep the Sabbath right. because as far as Christ is concerned, there is no Sabbath. That's right. And we'll show you that in the book of Hebrews in just a moment. Yes. But I don't, I don't, you know, you don't run your brother down. No. What you do with a young Christian who's, who maybe get, gets hooked into some of this stuff, be patient and be gracious with them, show them respect, and begin to drop little bombs here and there from the Scripture and say, look how the Holy Ghost deals with this. And here's a big bomb. Look at the book of Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse 1. Hebrews 4, 1. Now one man esteemeth one day above another. He sets it aside and says, this is a holy day. Oh, is it? This is a holy place. Is it really? This is a holy thing. Is that right? The only holy in this world today is the Holy Ghost Amen. that puts you into the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's holy. All right? You don't need places, days, rocks, any of the rest of that. In Christ you are complete. But now look at Hebrews 4 and look how, the, look how he argues this, presents this, and makes the comparison. This is important. Now look at Hebrews 4.1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Now he's talking about a rest here. He's talking to Jews here. He's talking to Hebrews. Do you know, do you know what the word Shabbat means in Hebrew? Shabbat Shalom. That's a common phrase they give so much. You know what Shalom means? Peace, exactly. All right. Shabbat Sabbath, rest. Okay, now look at this again. 
For unto us was the gospel preached as well as to them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Now look carefully at the argument. We're going to park here for just a moment and take this very carefully. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, the writer here just told you that as far as God's concerned, it was done before he ever made the man. See, it was completed. The Lamb of God sacrificed from the foundation of the world. In other words, before the world was ever made, the Lord Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God. Now hold on, now watch this. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. Now here you argue, here's, here's your writer of Hebrews. He's dealing with the seventh day. What day is that, folks? Saturday. Right, Sabbath, but it's Saturday. in our calendars. It's Saturday, right? All right, it's Saturday, okay. All right, he said he speaks of the seventh day on this wise. Look at it, it brings it straight to you. Now watch this. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Now here we have it brought in before you. Let's ask, ask a simple question tonight. Was God tired when he finished creation? No. Okay, so that eliminates immediately the idea that rest has to do with, has anything to do with God being tired. No. So what does that have to do with then? Ceasing. It's a completion. It's a cessation. He ceases. Yes. Now watch this. And God did rest the seventh day from all of his works. All right, he rested. He ceased. He wasn't tired. But what happened? Week after week after week after week after week after week, the Sabbath kept popping up. Well, if the Sabbath meant a completion, if it was over, finished, why does it continue to pop up? Why does it continue to come up? Why over and over and over and over and over and over again? He said he offered one sacrifice for sins forever and sat down at the right hand of the Father. It kept coming over and over and over. Was he tired? Of course not. He was finished. Week after week until Christ came, the weekly Sabbath reminded them that it was not finished. That's what it was reminding them of. The Christians met on the first day of the week because it was finished. No need for it anymore. It's done, paid for. Why would you bring a weak and beggarly element up into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and hold that in his face when he said on the cross, it is finished? It's done for. Well, I have to do, no, you don't have to do anything but accept the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. When you receive him, it's finished. Now, well, I know a good brother and he keeps the Sabbath. That's all right. Remember what Paul said in Romans. One man esteemeth one day above another and so forth and so on. But which Sabbath? The Saturday Sabbath or the Christian Sabbath as they call it? Why do they call it the Christian Sabbath? Because they observe Saturday. Well, originally it is to separate themselves from the Jew. It is to say that we're not Jews, we're Christians, and so therefore we're going to have Sunday. Well, they met on the first day of the week. The Lord Jesus Christ arose on the first day of the week. And why did he arise on the first day of the week? Because the week was finished. So he started a new week. See, it's a new week. It's not part of the old week. The old week's over. So if seven finishes it, what's the next number? Eight. Eight. And the gematria of his name is eight, eight, eight. New beginning, new beginning, new beginning. Amen, amen, amen. So in Christ, all things are new. You remember that thing over there in the book of John chapter number two, the water turned to wine. That was laying a tap down for you to let you know that you do not take old, old, old skins and put new wine in it because something's going to happen and it won't be able to hold it. 
So then what, what does this mean to me? It means this. It means that if somebody comes along and tells me, well, you know what, it's okay to observe the Passover. You can learn a lot from it and just kind of get in there and, and, uh, and, and it's a special day. Oh, is it really? Well, the Apostle Paul said, Christ is my Passover. That's what he said. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And your writer of Hebrews just told you that the Sabbath was when God rested but the resting had already been finished before the foundation of the world. He gave them something to remember what was done over and over and over and over, week after week after week. And then it finished because Christ died and finished it. And now there's a new day. I want you to notice something else here in Revelation chapter number seven and verse three. And I'll close out with you on this. Revelation 7, 3. The scripture says, Saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. You all have read your Bible. When, when does this take place? What, what's it called? The tribulation, right? It's called the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, seven-year period. All right. So you've got the tribes of the children of Israel in the tribulation. Is that scriptural? Absolutely. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. No question about it. Well, then what kind of a mess are you getting into if you're calling yourself one of the tribes of Israel? See what I mean? You see what British Israelism done? And they're smart people. A lot of them are good people. No question about that. I don't doubt that for a moment. But what are you doing? You're, you're putting yourself right into the tribulation. Of course, you're not. You're not. I do not believe that. I believe that the Jew, as it was in the time of Christ 2,000 years ago, the Bible says that Anna and Simeon were the two people that were waiting. One for the consolation of Israel. Anna did stayed at the temple Night and day, she lived there. Her life was with the Lord. She dedicated her life to him. So Anna was plainly said to be of the tribe of Asher. There you are. And Asher is one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Amen. So what's that important? It's important because they tell you that the 12 tribes were lost. Or the 10 northern tribes. Anyway, Benjamin and Judah stayed in the south, but they were lost. The lost tribes of Israel. And then, of course, if you've lost them, then you can go back into this long, elaborate thing and say, well, they really weren't lost. They're the Anglo-Saxon British people. And so therefore, when King Charles is coronated this coming Saturday, he will be the king over the house of David, the 10 tribes of Israel. In plain words, he will have the spiritual authority over the whole world. Now, do you know who it was that separated himself from the Pope of Rome? Henry That's right. Do you remember why? It's pretty, 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 uh, <laughs> I mean, pretty, pretty rudimentary. <laughs> Pope wouldn't give him an annulment. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. He wanted a, they say he wanted a male heir to the throne. So what happened? Well, when Henry VIII separated England from the, from the Pope in Rome, he started his own church. That's called the Church of England. Here in the country after the, uh, after the war, uh, with the Revolutionary War, they called it the Anglican Church or the Episcopal Church in this country. is a direct descendant of that. So what's happened? Well, he has come out and he is the head. King Charles III is the head of the Church of England. Right. He's the head of it. Uh, he's... Uh, the, who's, who's, who's the next man underneath him? Uh, the uh, of what? Canterbury. That's it. The Archbishop of Canterbury. And on down it goes. So he's the head of the church that is of the body of the, of the throne of David that has the mandate from God to cover the earth and to carry it out. And so therefore he has a divine mandate to bring into subjection this world. And uh, so why is that important? That's important because we're living in the end times. We're living in the end times. 
And uh, we're getting closer and closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we need to look for are figures that get, begin to emerge from the crowd. Yes, watch for them. Watch for them. Uh, there's a lot about England that's good. It's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. We owe so much to the English-speaking people, no question about that. And uh, they, uh, they've, given, they've given us and they've given the world so many good things, no doubt about it. And we get an enormous amount of emails from people in Great Britain, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, uh, the United Kingdom. We get, we get a, lot of, uh, lot, a lot of people over there watching them, and some of them probably watching right now while I'm talking about this. And, uh, and we want them to know, there's no question, they're our brothers and our sisters in the Lord. If they know the Lord Jesus, they are. No doubt about it whatsoever. But stick in the book. Stick in the book. Stick with the Bible. The Bible will get you through it. Father, bless your word. The time we've had together tonight to study it. Our Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And for his sake I ask it. And amen.